Hello, welcome to the Comeback Champion. I am so grateful and honored to be a, one of the speakers of this great summit, and I really want to thank the visionary of this conference, Shay Brown, and all the people that made this possible. My name is Dr. Connie Green. I am a certified Christian counselor, certified life coach, author of two books, When Love Hurts and When Love Heals. And I am just so excited to have you here with me today. I help hurting amazing people overcome life disappointments through disappointments and hurt and pain, emotionally drained, feel broken, stuck in unforgiveness, afraid and unsure about their next steps. I teach them to create a new life for themselves and to stay strong, empowering them on how to be disentangled from abusive relationships and learn how to be forgive and rise up out of the ashes of despair and trauma to become powerful, confident people like a comeback champion. Today I want to talk a little bit about the startling the statistics of domestic violence. On average, nearly 20 people per minute physically get abused by their partner. One in four women and one in nine men experience severe physical abuse. And the impact is startling. They are injured, fearful, post-traumatic stress dis disorders, and they also have to use victim services. They contract sexual transmitted diseases, and it can be startling for a lot of them because some of the behaviors that are seen during this time of abuse is pushing, slapping, shoving, and that's one in three women and one in four men experience that. And one in seven women and one in 25 men have been injured by their partners severely. And one in 10 women have been raped by their partners. So as you can see, it's been some stalling statistics here and behaviors that are, is very epic. And I really want to come to you all today to encourage you all that you can get out of that situation and do something about your situation. This brings me back to a defining moment in my life when I was a very young lady, or should I say a young child. I was just 15 years old when the incident happened. I was raised the oldest of five children from the union of my mother and my father. My father being married before, there was at least 12 of us because I had an uncle that lived with us as well. We grew up on welfare in a violently abusive, alcohol-infested home where roaches and rats felt like they, that, they, that it was their home. <laughs> when you compound the stress of raising kids and the woes of poverty and systemic racism and the constant demons of mental illness and alcoholism, you have a recipe for disaster. As a matter of fact, there was fussing and fighting every weekend in my life. I constantly was in fear because at any moment I would have to run out of the house when something would happen. Somebody either got shot or cut or my father was getting ready to punch my mother again and she would grab us and run out the door. Sometime in the cold dead of winter, I was being the oldest in the house would have to grab blankets and run and grab the smallest ones to run out the house and we would catch the bus and many times we would go over my grandmother's house again and she would often tell my mother, Doris, if you don't leave, John is going to kill you. To hear that ringing in my ears, a young lad, over and over again, of course, it caused me a lot of panic attacks. But it began to be a way of life, and so I just looked to accept on weekends there was always going to be some type of drama. So it wasn't long after my grandmother continued to tell my mother that over and over again. I remember it like it was yesterday. We had ran into my grandmother's house like we normally do. And my mother had been cut in her back and was in the hospital. And when she got back home, my grandmother said, Doris, please leave John. He's going to kill you. Well, it was two weeks after that. I was age 15. And my father, in an alcohol-induced rage, savagely murdered my mother with a single shot to her stomach. In one second, I lost my mother and my father. 
I lost my mother to death. I lost my father to prison in streets. And later on in his older life, Alzheimer's, in which I had to be the one to bury him because he didn't have any insurance. The effects was traumatic. My heart would pound, my head would hurt. I hated my daddy. I was overwhelmed. We was just all torn apart. All my brothers and sisters, we were torn apart into different homes. And there I lost my mom, my dad, and now my sisters and brothers. I was just so overwhelmed and I still had, had to go to school. I was just so overwhelmed to I attempted numerous suicides. I even went back in my mind and I thought about all the things that had happened to me as a little child. I thought about the beatings after my daddy would punch my mom and I would try to help her, he would hit me. My brothers and sisters took the brunt of the beating because they were little boys and they tried to help mama many times. Many times I would just walk away because I was tired of getting slapped. I would attempt suicide because I always, I also thought about how I was molested by a family member at a very young age in my home. I was raped. I was homeless after my mama died, after I left from my, 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 my family member's house. We were looking for housing. I had battles with my own alcoholism just to numb the pain. I began to have depression, anxiety, fear. I struggled, struggled for significance. I wanted to be loved. I wanted to be held, but I didn't have my mom. Nobody can be like your mom. Although my aunt took me in, she loved me. She did what she could, but it was a missing void. I miss my mama's voice. I miss her crying and telling me that she needed help and I couldn't help her. I remember when she fell out because she was on alcohol and she had a problem with her health and she would fall out and faint and go into convulsions because of the alcoholism. I am the one that had to clean up the mess and take her a bath. I was so used and I was so accustomed to taking care not on her, but my brothers and sisters, it was four of them. My baby sister, hallelujah, forgive me. I just got to keep going. God is going to help me. I'm getting a little emotional right now. But I had a little sister that I used to take care of like she was my own. And I, when she left after my mother died, I felt like I had lost my child. It was painful. It got so bad that when I wanted to see her, I couldn't go see her because I didn't have a car. And when they would tell me no, that was, that was more pain that I experienced. I wanted to see my brothers and sisters, but I couldn't go all the time to visit them. But however, in the spite of all the misery that I went through and the pain and the emotional struggles that I went through, it always seemed in my mind that there was something greater than myself. I knew it was a God because my grandmother used to tell me about God. She used to tell me to pray and how I could speak to God. But I really didn't know him for myself. My mom and daddy sent me to Sunday school, but they never went to Sunday school. So we wasn't that religious, not in that home, because I always seen trauma and bitterness and anger and fear. That was my life as a young girl. So can you just imagine at 15 years old, trying to go to school, trying to graduate? And then I was failing in school because I couldn't concentrate. But I think the Lord for helping me get through that situation. The suicide attempts was horrific because I really wanted to just let go. And then I felt bad when I woke up in the hospital both times and I was still alive. Then I was mad because God didn't let me die. I wanted to numb the pain. But lo and behold, as I continued to live and I got married at a young age, a man that loved me and cared about me with all of my broke, brokenness and all of my drama. It wasn't long after that I gave my life to the Lord. It was in the 80s. And when I gave my life to the Lord, I was supernaturally delivered. I can't explain it. Some people don't believe it. I went to the church one night. A young lady at work invited me to church. She was only 19 years old, a young, young lady. And I... I really didn't even respect the fact that she even invited me. As a matter of fact, I even 
was very mean and rude to her because I was just angry and bitter. And I asked her, why do you want me to go to church with you? But she invited me anyway, and, and she bribed me. She said, if you go to church with me, I'll give you, uh, I'll pay for you a dinner tonight, and, I, and I'll pay for it. And i give you anything else you want as a dessert or whatever. So I went to church with her, and that night, my life never was the same. I gave my life to the Lord, and the rest was history. And I just want to share with you how God can come and miraculously heal you from depression, alcoholism, and resentment. He did it for me, and he can do it for you. I am so excited to share my testimony. I hope you got something out of it. But what I want to share with you right now is years ago, after I gave my life to the Lord, I promised myself that I would help women that are abused and children that have been mistreated for the rest of my life. That would be my mandate. That would be my calling. I didn't want anybody to go through what I went through as a child and even as a young adult. And even in my marriage, I was so confused. I didn't even know how to love. But I just thank God that I had that opportunity for somebody to pour into me and show me the way that gave me the deliverance I need. So at this time, I want to expose some things to you, some attributes. I want to expose some attributes to you on how that you can identify an abusive partner. And I want you to take notes because this, this is going to help you. I lived it till I was 15 years old. And the number one attribute of that abuser is manipulative. My daddy was a very handsome man. Everybody loved him. Nobody would have never known what we were going through in our home, that he beat my mother on a regular basis. They loved him. They smiled when they seen him. He was a good-looking man. And, of course, you know, the women loved him. He was at home sometime, and sometime he was gone. But you know how it is. You know, you just had to live what you had to live as a child. But I seen the things that my daddy did. He was a, he was a liar, and he, he always would pretend like he was something that he wasn't. He would make my mother look like she was crazy. He would say he didn't do things that he did. And I, I could see the things that he did to her. But when he would talk to her about it, he would say, I didn't do that. It sort of reminds me of gaslighting. It is when somebody is trying to systematically twist and, 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 and twist the truth and make you believe that you're crazy or something is wrong with you to cover up their behaviors and their deceptions. And, and it's said that it is a psychological abuse that these abusers do to the people that they meet. Also, number three, they are actors. They are great actors. They're good at what they do. They encourage people. They are confident. Uh, you know, they, they'll tell you information if you try to correct them about their behavior and tell them that they're lying and they're wrong. They'll stay, say, say stuff like, uh, I don't remember that. I don't know what you're talking about. Number four, they're, they're animated people. They love to pretend like they're somebody else. And people love them because of the way they act and the way they look and how they present themselves. Most abusers are very intelligent people and they're very attractive, they're good looking. And most people believe in people that are good looking and they feel like they have a good judge of character when they come in contact with them rather than an unattractive person. Number six, they are natural performers. They can adapt to, to changes and in a discord, and they can just act spontaneously and change the subject instead of just telling the truth. They have the experience of lying because they lie so much. And so when it comes to somebody getting emotional or afraid or anything, it doesn't bother them at all because they can think quick on their feet and they'll turn it around and pretend like the person just doesn't know what they're talking about. They're great speakers, great listeners, and they love to twist words so they are twist words so you, they can get some time to come out with a response to confuse you. And number nine, they are controllers. They are controllers. I call them control freaks. They are so controlling that what they want to do, they want to have dominion over you. They want to have influence over you. They want to have authority over you. They want to hold you in resistance 
be a master over you, restrain you to retain you. Now, I want you to write that down. These are some of the signs of abusers. When somebody's trying to control you, the first thing they're trying to do, they're going to make you feel like that they don't trust you. And they feel like you can't do anything right. They don't respect you or your judgment. They think that you're incompetent. They don't value you. They don't value your skills or your expertise. You feel disrespected. They try to control you and assume that you don't know nothing. They run and control. They give you expensive gifts, make empty promises. Then they can't even keep up with what they told you they're going to do. They shout, nag, and threaten you. They withhold affection. They bully you, bully you or boss you around, invade your privacy. So I just want you to keep these things in mind and be aware. And one of the other controlling attributes of them is they, are, they can be hurtful and they can cause injury psychologically. They're stubborn. They know everything. You can't tell them nothing. Everything is right concerning them. They are invasive. They don't respect your privacy. They snoop around in areas that they have no business snooping around in. They are perfectionists. They expect you to be perfected because they are perfected. They are critical. Some of the most painful people I know are critical people. They want you to be disconnected from relationships and families and friends. They accuse you of being unfaithful. I said, and I mentioned, I don't know about you, but as for me, I serve the Lord. You may have somebody else that you serve, and, and that's good. Whatever it takes, do it for you. With me, I pray constantly. I became a prayer warrior. I made that, me that my medicine morning, noon, and night. I prayed. I built up a relationship with the Lord, and I began to read scriptures, affirmations. I began to change my mindset. Everybody that I came in contact with, and they would get me upset or something, I would be angry and I would blame my daddy. I was in a room full of people and I was still lonely. My daddy didn't physically kill me, but he killed me emotionally because it was like a spirit of heaviness that constantly laid on me day after day. I was very offensive. I had low self-esteem. I was in a place where I didn't want to be around anybody, just my family. So after I started building up on the mindset and, re and changing my mind and re renewing my mind, I began to feel freer within myself. I had to first also realize who I was and what I wanted. When I found out I was fearfully and wonderfully made and that I could do all things through Christ that strengthens me, that built up my strength. That built up my ability to feel like I was somebody. And I felt like the Lord was like a father type to me that I could go to him when I wanted to talk to my daddy because I was a daddy's girl. That's why it was so devastating for me when my daddy killed my mother. I had to believe I could, 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 could achieve my goals and, and, and my dreams that I wanted. I, I refused to let the enemy continue to destroy my happiness. So I began to forgive. I forgave my father. I was supernaturally healed. But it took a process. Although I got that going on and when I gave my life to the Lord, I felt free. I remember the time when I went to my father and I, and I looked at him in his eyes and I told him that the Lord wanted me to come find him. Right after I had that supernatural encounter, I found my father. And he was living in an abandoned car. I didn't even recognize him. He was a light-skinned man. He looked almost like he was white. He had gray eyes. This man was dark. I didn't even recognize him. His hair was all over his head. He looked like a homeless man because he was homeless. He lived in a car. And that's the defining moment I had. I seen my father. I grabbed him. He was stinking. He smelled like penure. But he was my daddy. Yeah, he was my daddy. And I said, Daddy, I forgive you. And he began to cry. At first, he asked me who I was, and that tore me up because I couldn't believe he didn't even know who I was. And I said, Daddy, I'm Connie, your older daughter, 
And he began to cry and cry. And I held him. And we cried and we wept. I had to learn to forgive. Yeah. 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 I had to learn to forgive. Hatred and unforgiveness is like a canker sore. Mm -hmm. And then it would develop to cancer. Mm -hmm. And it would eat at your soul. Yes. That's when I felt the pressure and the pain and the heaviness leave me. And my life has never been the same. I forgave my father totally. Yes, I had an encounter for God and it helped me go on with my life. But when I told him I forgave him, that was the secret. And that's what I want you to see today. Let go and let God. Unforgiveness is like a poison. You're wanting to give it to somebody else, but you're drinking it yourself. You've got to forgive. It's something mystical about forgiveness. God forgave us and gave his whole life for us on the cross, and he died, and he didn't deserve it because he was God himself. So it's a secret about forgiveness, and it's so simple. Tis, it's just amazing. Just If you would just take that one step, you will see how it works for you. If it works for me, it's going to work for you. Forgive and let go. Be amazing. You can be a comeback champion and you can get your happiness back. You can get your joy back. Depression will leave you and you will begin to love people again. You can have joy. You just got to make up your mind. I'm not going to be depressed no more. You got to tell the devil, stop right here. I ain't going there today with you. On the worst, on the day that you wake up one morning, you feel the worst you ever feel, you need to flex the devil and put on the best suit you ever had, the best dress you ever had, your heels, put your makeup on, comb your hair, you get up in the mirror and just get a smile. Hurt and pain, but just smile. Can I get a smile from y'all right now? Because I don't like the way y'all look at me. I'm being scared. That day, that defining moment of my life when I forgave my father, I began to love everybody. My whole personality came back because if you forgive, God will forgive you. If we don't forgive, he said he wouldn't forgive us. As a matter of fact, he told me to go find my father because I wasn't going to heaven and I thought I was saved. Full of the Holy Ghost, as the old folks say. But I wasn't because you can't be saved and you're hating somebody else. I'm talking to somebody right now. You're not happy. You buy things to feel happy. You sleep around at night to feel happy. You talk about people to feel happy. Jesus. You stay on the Facebook to feel happy. Hello. You give a dog to be happy. <laughs> well, maybe the pocketbook will work. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. You're not happy. You're doing all this stuff. Yes. You smile. You lift your head up like you got it all in, in a bag of chips. Yes. And you don't even have no chips. Because you got no money to buy the chips. When my daddy killed my mother. It was hard. It was the hardest experience I ever experienced in my life. I learned that the most precious le lessons in life could be the power of forgiveness. Although my father didn't take my life physically, he took my life mentally and emotionally. I spent years hating him. Both incidents from when he tried to kill me and my sisters and brothers until the time he killed my mother. I was stuck in the ages of 12 to 15, constantly reliving the trauma Every bad thing that happened to me, I blamed my father. My health suffered. I was angry all the time. I was lonely in rooms full of people. I turned to substance abuse to numb the pain until I saw something greater than myself. Unforgiveness kills. I realized that the more I hated, I had in my heart the more hate I had in my heart, the more I would never truly come to love again. I wasn't ever, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy process. And I surely, it wasn't an easy process, and surely it wasn't a human process. I had to call on the powers much greater than myself. Because when you are spiritually dead and need a breath of life, that can only come from God. 
I thank God that I was miraculously able to overcome depression, alcoholism, and resentment toward my father and all the other people that victimized me. And you can do it too. Give us the release. Give us the release. To be free, God. Come on, if you it doesn't matter what they did to you. He reigns on the just as well as the unjust. I know we can't understand it. It doesn't seem fair. Oh, God, but you don't know what they did. Oh, oh he knows. Yeah, he knows. Stay connected and motivated. Create a contract plan for your success. Have a prayer life. And forgive because forgiveness is good for the soul. It's like spiritual surgery. It can heal the hurt. My name is Dr. Connie Green. I'm a comeback champion. And if you would like to follow me, you can follow me at, at Dr. Green on all the social media platforms. Today is my January 1st. And I want to remind you that you are amazing. Because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, I have a gift for you. Just look at the address on the screen. And remember, you are a comeback champion.